The Provisional Irish Republican Army was an Irish Republican paramilitary organization that sought to remove Northern Ireland from the United Kingdom and bring about an independent republic encompassing all of Ireland. It emerged in December 1969 a euro after the beginning of the True Blazer Euro, when the Irish Republican Army split over ideology and how to respond to attacks on Catholics in Northern Ireland. Catholic demands for civil rights had been met with violence from Ulster loyalists and from the government of Northern Ireland, culminating in the August 1969 riots and deployment of British troops. The Provisional IRA was the biggest and most active Republican paramilitary during the Troubles. It saw itself as the only rightful successor to the original IRA and called itself simply the Irish Republican Army, or a Glenaha Permel Irian in Irish. It was also widely referred to as such by others. The IRA is a prescribed organization in the UK under the Terrorism Act 2000 and an unlawful organization in the Republic of Ireland. The United States includes them in the category of other selected terrorist groups also deemed of relevance in the global war on terrorism. Overview of strategies The IRA's initial strategy was to use force to cause the collapse of the government of Northern Ireland and to inflict enough casualties on British forces that the British government would be forced by public opinion to withdraw from the region. This policy involved recruitment of volunteers, increasing after the 1972 Bloody Sunday incident in which the British military killed unarmed protesters, and launching attacks against British military and economic targets. The campaign was supported by arms and funding from Libya and from some groups in the United States. The IRA agreed to a ceasefire in February 1975, which lasted nearly a year before the IRA concluded that the British were drawing them into politics without offering any guarantees in relation to the IRA's goals, and hopes of a quick victory receded. As a result, the IRA launched a new strategy known as the Long War. This saw them conduct a war of attrition against the British and increase emphasis on political activity, via the political party Sinn Féin copyright in. The success of the 1981 Irish hunger strike in mobilizing support and winning elections led to the Armalite and ballot box strategy, with more time and resources devoted to political activity. The abortive attempt at an escalation of the military part of that strategy led Republican leaders increasingly to look for a political compromise to end the conflict, with a broadening dissociation of Sinn Féin copywriting from the IRA. Following negotiations with the Social Democratic and Labour Party and secret talks with British civil servants, the IRA ultimately called a ceasefire in 1994 on the understanding that Sinn Féin copywriting would be included in political talks for a settlement. When the British government, dependent on Ulster Unionist Party votes at Westminster, then demanded the disarmament of the IRA before it allowed Sinn Féin copyrighting into multi-party talks, the IRA called off its ceasefire in February 1996. This demand was quickly dropped after the May 1997 general election in the UK. The IRA ceasefire was then reinstated in July 1997 and Sinn Féin copyrighting was admitted into all party talks which produced the Good Friday Agreement of 1998. The IRA's armed campaign, primarily in Northern Ireland but also in England and mainland Europe, caused the deaths of approximately 1,800 people. The dead included around 1,100 members of the British security forces, and about 640 civilians. The IRA itself lost 275 a Euro 300 members and an estimated 10,000 imprisoned at various times over the 30-year period. On July 28, 2005, the IRA Army Council announced an end to its armed campaign, stating that it would work to achieve its aims using purely political and democratic programs through exclusively peaceful means, and shortly afterwards completed decommissioning. In September 2008, the 19th report of the Independent Monitoring Commission stated that the IRA was committed to the political path, and no longer represented a threat to peace or to democratic politics, and that the IRA's Army Council was no longer operational or functional. The organization remains classified as a proscribed terrorist group in the UK and as an illegal organization in the Republic of Ireland. Two small groups split from the provisional IRA the Continuity IRA in 1986, and the Real IRA in 1997. 
both reject the Good Friday Agreement and continue to engage in paramilitary activity. On July 26, 2012, it was announced that some former members of the Provisional Irish Republican Army were merging with the Real Irish Republican Army, other independent Republican paramilitary groups and the vigilante group Republican Action Against Drugs into a unified formation known simply as the Irish Republican Army. This new IRA group is estimated by Police Service of Northern Ireland intelligence sources to have between 250 and 300 active militants and many more supporting associates. Origins in August 1969, a confrontation between Catholic residents of the Bogside and police in Derry following an apprentice boys of Derry march led to a large communal riot now referred to as the Battle of the Bogside a Euro three days of fighting between rioters throwing stones and petrol bombs and police who saturated the area with CS gas. Protests and riots organized by NICRA in support of the Bogsiders began elsewhere in the province sparking retaliation by Protestant mobs. The subsequent burning, damage to property and intimidation largely against the minority community forced 1,505 Catholics from their homes in Belfast in what became known as the Northern Ireland Riots of August 1969, with over 200 Catholic homes being destroyed or requiring major repairs and a number of people were killed on both sides, some by the forces of law and order. The Irish Republican Army had been poorly armed and unable to adequately defend the Catholic community, which had been considered one of its traditional roles since the 1920s. Veteran Republicans were critical of the IRA's Dublin leadership which, for political reasons, had refused to prepare for aggressive action in advance of the violence. On August 24 Joe Cahill, Seamus Twimmy, Dar Ither Canale, Billy McKee and several other future provisional leaders came together in Belfast intending to remove the Belfast leadership and turn back to traditional militant republicanism. Although the pro goulding commander Billy McMillan stayed in command, he was told it was only for three months and he was not to have any communication with the IRA's Dublin-based leadership. Traditional Republicans formed the Provisional Army Council in December 1969, after an IRA Army convention was held at Knock Biker House in Boyle, County Roscommon. The two main issues were the acceptance of the National Liberation Strategy and a motion to end abstentionism and to recognize the British, Irish and Northern Ireland parliaments. While the motion on the National Liberation Strategy was passed unanimously the motion on abstentionism was only passed by 28 votes to 12. Opponents of this change argued strongly against the ending of abstentionism, and when the vote took place, CN Max Station Offer in, present as IRA Director of Intelligence, announced that he no longer considered that the IRA leadership represented Republican goals. However, there was not a walkout. Those opposed, who included Max Station Offer in and Valera Bradaya, refused to go forward for election to the new IRA executive. While others canvassed support throughout Ireland, Max Station Offer in was a key person making a connection with the Belfast IRA under Billy McKee and Joe Cahill who had refused to take orders from the IRA's Dublin leadership since September 1969, in protest at their failure to defend Catholic areas in August. Nine out of thirteen IRA units in Belfast sided with the Provisionals in December 1969, roughly 120 activists and 500 supporters. The first Provisional Army Council was composed of CN Max Station Offer in, Raya Bradaya, Paddy Mulcahy, Sean Tracy, Leo Martin, and Joe Cahill, and issued their first public statement on December 28, 1969, stating, We declare our allegiance to the 32-county Irish Republic, proclaimed at Easter 1916, established by the first Dáil Irian in 1919, overthrown by forces of arms in 1922 and suppressed to this day by the existing British-imposed six-county and 26-county partition states. The Sinn Féin copyright in party split along the same lines on January 11, 1970, when a third of the delegates walked out of the RFHEIS in protest at the party leadership's attempt to force through the ending of abstentionism, despite its failure to achieve a two-thirds majority vote of delegates required to change the policy. Despite the declared support of that faction of Sinn Féin copyright in, the early provisional IRA was extremely suspicious of political activity arguing rather for the primacy of armed struggle. 
There are allegations that the early provisional IRA received arms and funding from the Fianna Fáil led Irish government in 1969, resulting in the 1970 arms trial in which criminal charges were pursued against two former government ministers. Roughly a £100,000 was donated by the Irish government to defence committees in Catholic areas and, according to historian Richard English, there is now no doubt that some money did go from the Dublin government to the proto-provisionals. The provisionals maintained the principles of the pre-1969 IRA. They considered both British rule in Northern Ireland and the government of the Republic of Ireland to be illegitimate, insisting that the provisional IRA's Army Council was the only valid government, as head of an all-island Irish Republic. This belief was based on a series of perceived political inheritances which constructed a legal continuity from the Second Dáil. The Provisionals inherited most of the existing IRA organisation in the North by 1971 and the more militant IRA members in the rest of Ireland. In addition, they recruited many young nationalists from the North, who had not been involved in the IRA before, but had been radicalised by the communal violence that broke out in 1969. These people were known in Republican parlance as 69ers, having joined after 1969. The Provisional IRA adopted the Phoenix as symbol of the Irish Republican rebirth in 1969. One of its common slogans is Out of the Ashes Rose the Provisionals. Organization, the Provisional IRA was organized hierarchically. At the top of the organization was the IRA Army Council, headed by the IRA Chief of Staff. Leadership, all levels of the organization were entitled to send delegates to IRA General Army Conventions. The GAC was the IRA's supreme decision-making authority. Before 1969, GACs met regularly. Since 1969, there have only been two, in 1970 and 1986, owing to the difficulty in organizing such a large gathering of an illegal organization in secret. The GAC in turn elected a 12-member IRA executive, which selected seven volunteers to form the IRA Army Council. For day-to-day -day purposes, authority was vested in the Army Council which, as well as directing policy and taking major tactical decisions, appointed a chief of staff from one of its number or, less commonly, from outside its ranks. The chief of staff then appointed an adjutant general as well as a general headquarters, which consisted of a number of individual departments. These departments were, IRA Quartermaster General, IRA Director of Finance. IRA Director of Engineering, IRA Director of Training, IRA Director of Intelligence, IRA Director of Publicity, IRA Director of Operations, IRA Director of Security, Regional Command. The IRA was divided into a Northern Command, which operated in the nine Ulster counties as well as County Leitrim and County Louth, and a Southern Command, operating in the rest of Ireland. The Provisional IRA was originally commanded by a leadership based in Dublin. However, in 1977, parallel to the introduction of cell structures at local level, command of the war zone was given to the Northern Command. According to Ed Maloney, these moves at reorganization were the idea of Ivor Bell, Jerry Adams and Brian Keenan. Brigades, the IRA refers to its ordinary members as volunteers. Up until the late 1970s, IRA volunteers were organized in units based on conventional military structures. Volunteers living in one area formed a company as part of a battalion, which could be part of a brigade, although many battalions were not attached to a brigade. For most of its existence, the IRA had five brigade areas within what it referred to as the war zone. These brigades were located in Armagh, Belfast, Derry, Donegal and Tyrone Monaghan. The Belfast Brigade had three battalions, respectively in the west, north and east of the city. In the early years of the Troubles, the IRA in Belfast expanded rapidly. In August 1969, the Belfast Brigade had just 50 active members. By the end of 1971, it had 1,200 members, giving it a large but loosely controlled structure. The Derry Brigade had two battalions a Euro one based in Derry City, known as the South Derry Brigade, and another in Donegal. 
The Derry Battalion became the Derry Brigade in 1972 after a rapid increase in membership following Bloody Sunday when British paratroopers killed 13 unarmed demonstrators at a civil rights march. Volunteers based in Donegal were a part of the Derry Brigade as well. County Armagh had three battalions, two very active ones in South Armagh and a less active unit in North Armagh. For this reason the Armagh IRA unit is often referred to as the South Armagh Brigade. Similarly, the Tyrone Monaghan Brigade, which operated from around the border of Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, is often called the East Tyrone Brigade. Fermanagh, Southdown and North Antrim had units not attached to brigades. The leadership structure at battalion and company level was the same, each had its own commanding officer, quartermaster, explosives officer and intelligence officer. There was sometimes a training officer or finance officer. Active service units, from 1973, the IRA started to move away from the larger conventional military organizational principle owing to its security vulnerability. A system of two parallel types of unit within an IRA brigade was introduced in place of the battalion structures. Firstly, the old company structures were used for tasks such as policing nationalist areas, intelligence gathering, and hiding weapons. These were essential support activities. However, the bulk of actual attacks were the responsibility of a second type of unit, the active service unit. To improve security and operational capacity, these ASUs were smaller, tight-knit cells, usually consisting of five to eight members. The ASU's weapons were controlled by a brigade's quartermaster. By the late 1980s and early 1990s, it was estimated that in the late 1980s the IRA had roughly 300 members in ASUs and about another 450 serving in supporting roles. The exception to this reorganization was the South Armagh Brigade, which retained its traditional hierarchy and battalion's structure and used relatively large numbers of volunteers in its actions. The IRA Southern Command, located in the Republic of Ireland, consists of a Dublin Brigade and a number of smaller units in rural areas. These were charged mainly with the importation and storage of arms for the northern units and with raising finances through robberies and other means. Details on Strategy 1969 Euro 1998 Initial phase, following the violence of August 1969, the IRA began to arm and train to protect nationalist areas from further attack. After the provisional split from the official IRA the provisional IRA began planning for an all-out offensive action against what it claimed was British occupation. The official IRA were opposed to such a campaign because they felt it would lead to sectarian conflict, which would defeat their strategy of uniting the workers from both sides of the sectarian divide. The IRA border campaign in the 1950s had avoided actions in urban centres of Northern Ireland to avoid civilian casualties and resulting sectarian violence. The provisional IRA, by contrast, was primarily an urban organisation, based originally in Belfast and Derry. The provisional IRA's strategy was to use force to cause the collapse of the Northern Ireland administration and to inflict casualties on the British forces such that the British government be forced by public opinion to withdraw from Ireland. According to journalist Brendan O'Brien, the thinking was that the war would be short and successful. Chief of Staff C. N. Mac Station offer and decided they would escalate, escalate and escalate until the British agreed to go. This policy involved recruitment of volunteers and carrying out attacks on British forces, as well as mounting a bombing campaign against economic targets. In the early years of the conflict, IRA slogans spoke of, Victory 1972, and then Victory 1974. Its inspiration was the success of the old IRA in the Irish War of Independence. In their assessment of the IRA campaign, the British Army would describe these years, 1970 a Euro 72, as the insurgency phase. The British government held secret talks with the IRA leadership in 1972 to try and secure a ceasefire based on a compromise settlement within Northern Ireland after the events of Bloody Sunday when IRA recruitment and support increased. The IRA agreed to a temporary ceasefire from June 26 to July 9. In July 1972, CN Mac Station offer in, Dar Ithaca Canal, Iver Bell, Seamus Twimmy, 
Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness met a British delegation led by William White Law. The Irish Republicans refused to consider a peace settlement that did not include a commitment to British withdrawal, a retreat of the British Army to its barracks, and a release of Republican prisoners. The British refused and the talks broke up. A Permalia Nua and the 1975 ceasefire, the Provisional's goal in this period was the abolition of both the Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland states and their replacement with a new All-Ireland Federal Republic, with decentralised governments and parliaments for each of the four Irish historic provinces. This programme was known as a Permalia Nua. The A Permalia Nua programme remained IRA policy until discontinued by the Army Council in 1979. A Permalia Nua remained Sinn Féin copyright in policy until 1982. By the mid-1970s, the hopes of the IRA leadership for a quick military victory were receding. The British military was unsure of when it would see any substantial success against the IRA. Secret meetings between provisional IRA leaders Runner Abra de Iyer and Billy McKee with British Secretary of State for Northern Ireland Merlin Rees secured an IRA ceasefire which began in February 1975. The IRA initially believed that this was the start of a long-term process of British withdrawal, but later came to the conclusion that Rees was trying to bring them into peaceful politics without offering them any guarantees. Critics of the IRA leadership most notably Jerry Adams, felt that the ceasefire was disastrous for the IRA, leading to infiltration by British informers, the arrest of many activists and a breakdown in IRA discipline resulting in sectarian killings and a feud with fellow Republicans in the official IRA. At this time, the IRA leadership, short of money, weapons and members, was on the brink of calling off the campaign. The ceasefire, however, broke down in January 1976. The Long War. Thereafter, the IRA evolved a new strategy which they called the Long War. This underpinned IRA strategy for the rest of the Troubles and involved the reorganization of the IRA into small cells in acceptance that their campaign would last many years before being successful and an increased emphasis on political activity through Sinn Féin copyright in. A Republican document of the early 1980s states. Both Sinn Féin copyright and the IRA play different but converging roles in the War of National Liberation. The Irish Republican Army wages an armed campaign. Sinn Féin copyright and maintains the propaganda war and is the public and political voice of the movement. The 1977 edition of the Green Book, an induction and training manual used by the IRA, describes the strategy of the Long War in these terms, a war of attrition against enemy personnel. British Army based on causing as many deaths as possible so as to create a demand from there, the British people at home for their withdrawal. A bombing campaign aimed at making the enemy's financial interests in our country unprofitable while at the same time curbing long-term investment in our country. To make the six counties ungovernable except by colonial military rule. To sustain the war and gain support for its ends by national and international propaganda and publicity campaigns. By defending the war of liberation by punishing criminals, collaborators and informers. Confidential documents released on December 30, 2008 from the British State Archives show that the IRA leadership proposed a ceasefire and peace talks to the British government in 1978. The British refused the offer. Prime Minister James Callaghan decided that there should be positive rejection of the approach on the basis that the Republicans were not serious and see their campaign as a long haul. Irish state documents from the same period say that the IRA had made a similar offer to the British the previous year. An Irish Defence Forces document, dated February 15, 1977, states that it is now known that feelers were sent out at Christmas by the top IRA leadership to interest the British authorities in another long ceasefire. 1981 Hunger Strikes and Electoral Politics IRA prisoners convicted after March 1976 did not have special category status applied in prison. In response, over 500 prisoners refused to wash or wear prison clothes. This activity culminated in the 1981 Irish hunger strike, when seven IRA and three Irish National Liberation Army members starved themselves to death in pursuit of political status. The hunger strike leader Bobby Sands and anti-H-block activist Owen Caron were elected to the British Parliament, 
and two other protesting prisoners were elected to the Irish Dáil. In addition, there were work stoppages and large demonstrations all over Ireland in sympathy with the hunger strikers. Over 100,000 people attended the funeral of Sands, the first hunger striker to die. After the success of IRA hunger strikers in mobilizing support and winning elections on an anti-H block platform in 1981, Republicans increasingly devoted time and resources to electoral politics, through the Sinn Féin copyright in party. Danny Morrison summed up this policy at a 1981 Sinn Féin copyright in RDFHEIS as a ballot paper in this hand and an armalite in the other. Peace strategy, the success of the 1981 Irish hunger strike in mobilizing support and winning elections led to what was referred to by Danny Morrison as, the Armalite and ballot box strategy with more time and resources devoted to political activity. The perceived stalemate along with British government's hints of a compromise and secret approaches in the early 1990s led Republican leaders increasingly to look for a political agreement to end the conflict, with a broadening dissociation of Sinn Féin copyright and from the IRA. Following negotiations with the Social Democratic and Labour Party and secret talks with British civil servants, the IRA ultimately called a ceasefire in 1994 on the understanding that Sinn Féin copyright in would be included in political talks for a settlement. When the British government then demanded the disarmament of the IRA before it allowed Sinn Féin copyright in into multi-party talks, the organization called off its ceasefire in February 1996. The renewed bombings caused severe economic damage with the Manchester bombing and the Docklands bombing causing approximately a £500 million in combined damage. After the ceasefire was reinstated in July 1997, Sinn Féin copyright in was admitted into all party talks, which produced the Good Friday Agreement of 1998. The IRA's armed campaign, primarily in Northern Ireland but also in England and mainland Europe, caused the deaths of approximately 1,800 people. The dead included around 1,100 members of the British security forces, and about 630 civilians. The IRA itself lost 275 a Euro 300 members, of an estimated 10,000 total over the 30-year period. According to author Ed Maloney, the IRA made an attempt to escalate the conflict with the so-called Tet Offensive in the 1980s, which was reluctantly approved by the Army Council and did not prove successful. On the other hand, public speeches from two Northern Ireland Secretaries of State, Peter Brook and Patrick Mayhew hint that, given the cessation of violence, a political compromise with the IRA was possible. Gerry Adams entered talks with John Hume, the leader of the moderate nationalist Social Democratic and Labour Party in 1993, and secret talks were also conducted since 1991 between Martin McGuinness and a senior MI6 officer, Michael Oatley. Thereafter, Adams increasingly tried to disassociate Sinn Féin copyright in from the IRA, claiming they were separate organizations and refusing to speak on behalf of the IRA. Within the Republican movement, the new strategy was described by the acronym TUAS, meaning either tactical use of armed struggle, or totally unarmed strategy. Weaponry and Operations In the early days of the Troubles the IRA was very poorly armed, mainly with Old World War II weaponry such as M1 Garands and Thompson submachine guns, but starting in the early 1970s it procured large amounts of modern weaponry from such sources as supporters in the United States, Libyan leader Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, and arms dealers in Europe, America, the Middle East and elsewhere. The Libyans supplied the IRA with the RPG-7. In the first years of the conflict, the IRA's main activities were providing firepower to support nationalist rioters and defending nationalist areas from attacks. The IRA gained much of its support from these activities, as they were widely perceived within the nationalist community as being defenders of Irish nationalist and Roman Catholic people against aggression. From 1971 to Euro 1994, the IRA launched a sustained offensive armed campaign that mainly targeted the British Army the Royal Ulster Constabulary, the Ulster Defence Regiment, and economic targets in Northern Ireland. In addition, some IRA members carried out attacks against Protestant civilians. The IRA was chiefly active in Northern Ireland, although it took its campaign to England and mainland Europe. 
the IRA also targeted certain British government officials, politicians, judges, establishment figures, British Army and police officers in England, and in other areas such as the Republic of Ireland, West Germany and the Netherlands. By the early 1990s, the bulk of the IRA activity was carried out by the South Armagh Brigade, well known through its sniping operations and attacks on British Army helicopters. The bombing campaign principally targeted political, economic and military targets, and approximately 60 civilians were killed by the IRA in England during the conflict. It has been argued that this bombing campaign helped convince the British government to negotiate with Sinn Féin copyright in after the IRA ceasefires of August 1994 and July 1997. Ceasefires and decommissioning of arms, on August 31, 1994, the IRA declared an indefinite ceasefire. However, from February 1996 until July 1997, the IRA called off its 1994 ceasefire because of its dissatisfaction with the state of negotiations. They reinstated the ceasefire in July 1997, and it has been in operation since then. The IRA decommissioned all of its remaining arms between July and September 2005. The decommissioning of his weaponry was supervised by the Independent International Commission on Decommissioning. Among the weaponry estimated to have been destroyed as part of this process were 1,000 rifles, 3 tons of Semtex, 20 Euro 30 heavy machine guns, 7 surface to air missiles, 7 flamethrowers, 1,200 detonators, 20 rocket propelled grenade launchers, 100 handguns, 100 plus hand grenades. Having compared the weapons destroyed with the British security forces' estimates of the IRA weaponry, and because of the IRA's full involvement in the process of destroying the weapons, the IICD arrived at their conclusion that all IRA weaponry has been destroyed. Alleged failure to decommission, since the process of decommissioning was completed, unnamed sources in MI5 and the Police Service of Northern Ireland have reported to the press that not all IRA arms were destroyed during the process. This claim remains unsubstantiated so far. In its report dated April 2006 the Independent Monitoring Commission stated that it had no reason to disbelieve the IRA or to suspect that it had not fully decommissioned. It believed that any weaponry that had not been handed in had been retained locally and against the wishes of the IRA leadership. The Russian and British intelligence services alleged that during the decommissioning process the IRA secretly purchased a consignment of 20 Russian Special Forces AN-94 rifles in Moscow. In mid-July 2013, the Garda displayed arms and explosives recently recovered from dissident Republicans in the Dublin area. The Garda believed this Semtex to have come from the Libyan connection back in the 1980s and therefore should have been decommissioned. Other activities Apart from its armed campaign, the IRA has also been involved in many other activities. Sectarian attacks and alleged ethnic cleansing, the IRA carried out sectarian attacks. Sutton attributes 130 sectarian killings of Protestants to the IRA. The IRA often denied being involved in such attacks and sometimes used cover names for such attacks. For example using the cover name the South Amar Republican Action Force. The IRA killed six Protestants at Tullyvolon. Some in the IRA were unhappy with it carrying out sectarian attacks, but others considered them effective in preventing sectarian attacks on Catholics, as for example in just ferrying the Kingsmill massacre of ten Protestants. A former head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service has accused the IRA's campaign in some border areas of amounting to ethnic cleansing. Sir Kenneth Bloomfield was speaking at the launch of Professor Henry Patterson's book which claims that in County Fermanagh the Protestant minority there believed they were being ethnically cleansed by the PIRA, although this is a contested allegation. Alleged involvement in organized crime, the IRA have allegedly been involved in criminal activities, including racketeering, bank robbery, fuel laundering, drug dealing and kidnapping. In 2004, a £26.5 million was stolen from the Northern Bank's vaults in Belfast city centre. The British and Irish governments agreed with the Chief Constable of the Police Service of Northern Ireland's report blaming the robbery on the IRA. On January 18, 2005, the IRA issued a statement denying any involvement in the robbery. In February 2005, 
The Independent Monitoring Commission's fourth report stated their belief that the robbery was carried out with the prior knowledge and authorization of the IRA's leadership. Commentators including Suzanne Breen have stated that the IRA was the only organization capable of carrying out the raid. In May 2009, two men were arrested in Cork, and charged with IRA membership and offenses relating to the robbery. According to several sources, the organization has also been involved in the Irish drugs trade. A 1999 report by John Horgan and Max Taylor cited Royal Ulster Constabulary reports, alleging that this involves the licensing of drug operations to criminal gangs and the payment of protection money, rather than direct involvement. According to Horgan and Taylor's report, the IRA are also involved in several legitimate businesses including taxi firms, construction, restaurants and pubs. The IRA have also been involved in racketeering, which involves the extortion of money from legitimate businesses for protection. Speaking at Shin Far Copyright in 2005 Art FHEIS, Jerry Adams stated that there is no place in republicanism for anyone involved in criminality. However, he went on to say we refuse to criminalize those who break the law in pursuit of legitimate political objectives. In 2013 it was reported that an Italian police investigation had revealed links between the IRA and the Mafia in AA 450M money laundering scheme. Vigilantism, the IRA saw itself as the police force of nationalist areas of Northern Ireland during the Troubles instead of the AUC. This was made possible by a feeling of mistrust by some members of the community against the police force and army. The feeling, that the AUC, B Specials, UDR, British Army and other arms of the governmental apparatus in Northern Ireland were biased against the nationalist community was not new. It predated the Troubles and took in organizations like the Ulster Defence Volunteers, a Home Guard body of World War II, who were also widely considered sectarian. Catholics did, however, serve in the UDV, Ulster Defence Regiment, and Royal Ulster Constabulary. Also, the AUC and other forces of the authorities were, in some instances, reluctant to enter or patrol certain nationalist areas unless it was in armoured Land Rovers and in convoy. Police stations were also heavily armoured because of persistent attacks from the IRA. This gave them the appearance of being fortresses. This vacuum in policing was functional for the IRA because it stopped the local community being in contact with the police which may have posed a threat if information was passed. Therefore, the community would turn to the IRA first to deal with troublemakers or those practicing what came to be called antisocial behavior. In efforts to stamp out antisocial behavior, and alleged instances of drug dealing reported to or noticed by the organization, the IRA killed or otherwise attacked suspected drug dealers and other suspected criminals. These attacks varied in severity and depended on various factors. In the first instance, the IRA may warn their intended victim, with further transgressions escalated to an attack known as a punishment beating. The process which the IRA went through to determine an offender's guilt or innocence was never open to debate or scrutiny. The IRA also engaged in attacks that broke the bones of alleged offenders, or involved shooting through the hands, or knees for persistent offenders of activities such as joyriding or drug dealing. In certain cases, for persistent offenders the IRA would intimidate the individual into leaving the country. This was known as being put out of the community country, and the clear message given to individuals served with these notices was that if they returned to the community country they would be killed. This practice was frequently criticized by all sections of the political establishment in Northern Ireland as summary justice. Informers, in an effort to stamp out what the IRA termed collaboration with British forces, and informing, they killed a number of Catholic civilians, such as Joseph Fenton. Purges against these individuals, whom the IRA considered traitors to their own community and to the cause of nationalism were most prevalent when the IRA found itself persistently vulnerable to infiltration. Investigations into informers and infiltration are suspected to have been dealt with by an IRA unit called the Internal Security Unit, known colloquially as the Nutting Squad. This unit is said to be directly attached to IRA GHQ. Where a confession was solicited, the victim was often exiled or executed with a bullet in the back of the head. The body was either buried or, 
later in the IRA campaign, left in a public place, often in South Amar. One particular example of the killing of a person deemed by the IRA to have been an informer that is the source of continuing controversy is that of Jean McConville from Belfast, who was killed by the IRA. Ed Maloney and IRA sources continue to claim she was an informer despite the police ombudsman recently stating that this was not the case. The Social Democratic and Labour Party have described the killing as a war crime. Her family contend that she was killed as a punishment for aiding a dying British soldier in West Belfast, however this claim has been rejected in an official investigation, while neither the Sutton Index or Lost Lives record the death of any British soldier near her home prior to her killing. In March 2014, Ivor Bell a Euro former IRA chief of staff a Euro was arrested and charged with aiding and abetting in the murder of Jean McConville. In April 2014, Shin Far copyright and leader Jerry Adams was arrested and questioned by PSNI detectives in relation to the abduction and murder of Jean McConville. He was released four days later without charge. In March 2007, police ombudsman Newal Oloan announced that there would be an inquiry into claims of collusion between IRA members working as agents for the Special Branch and other agencies in the British security forces. Collusion with Irish security forces in December 2013 the report of the Smithwick Tribunal found there was collusion between the IRA and members of the Garda Sea in the murders of two RUC officers in 1989. Attacks on other Republican paramilitary groups, the IRA has also feuded with other Republican paramilitary groups such as the official IRA in the 1970s and the Irish People's Liberation Organization in the 1990s. Leading real Irish Republican Army member Joseph O'Connor was shot dead in Ballymorthy, West Belfast on October 11, 2000. Claims have been made by O'Connor's family and people associated with the RIRA that he was killed by the IRA as a result of a feud between the organizations, but Sinn Far copyright and denied the claims. No one has been charged with his killing. Casualties, this is a summary. For a detailed breakdown of casualties caused by and inflicted on the IRA see Provisional IRA Campaign 1969-1997 Casualties. The IRA was responsible for more deaths than any other group during the Troubles. Two very detailed studies of deaths in the Troubles, the Kane Project at the University of Ulster, and Lost Lives, differ slightly on their numbers killed by the IRA, but a rough synthesis gives a figure of 1,800 deaths. Of these, roughly 1,100 were members or former members of the security forces, British Army, Royal Ulster Constabulary and Ulster Defence Regiment. An estimated 510 were civilians according to Sutton, while the civilian toll reaches 640 per McKittrick. The remainder were either loyalist or republican paramilitaries. The IRA lost a little under 300 members killed in the Troubles. In addition, Roughly 50 a Euro 60 members of Sinn Far copyright in were killed. However there were far more IRA volunteers imprisoned as opposed to killed. Journalists A. Amon Mali and Patrick Bishop estimate in their book The Provisional IRA that roughly 8,000 people passed through the ranks of the IRA in the first 20 years of its existence, many of them leaving after arrest, retiring from the armed campaign or disillusionment. They give 10,000 as the total number of past and present IRA members at that time. Categorization The IRA is a prescribed organization in the United Kingdom under the Terrorism Act 2000 and an unlawful organization in the Republic of Ireland under the Offences Against the State Acts. Harold Wilson's secret 1971 meeting with IRA leaders with the help of John O'Connell angered the Irish government. Garrett Fitzgerald wrote 30 years later that the strength of the feelings of our democratic leaders was not, however, publicly ventilated at the time, because Wilson was a former and possible future British Prime Minister. Members of IRA are tried in the Republic of Ireland in the Special Criminal Court. In Northern Ireland, the IRA are referred to as terrorists by the Ulster Unionist Party, the Democratic Unionist Party, the Progressive Unionist Party the Alliance Party of Northern Ireland, and the Social Democratic and Labour Party. On the island of Ireland, the largest political party to state that the IRA is not a terrorist organisation is Sinn Féin Copyright Inn. Sinn Féin Copyright Inn is widely regarded as the political wing of the IRA, 
but the party insists that the two organizations are separate. The United States includes them in the category of other selected terrorist groups also deemed of relevance in the global war on terrorism. Peter Mandelson, a former Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, contrasted the post-1997 activities of the IRA with those of Al-Qaeda, describing the latter as terrorists, and the former as freedom fighters. The IRA prefer the terms freedom fighter, soldier, or volunteer. The U.S. Department of State falls short of listing the IRA as a foreign terrorist organization, but includes them in the category other selected terrorist groups also deemed of relevance in the global war on terrorism. The organization has also been described as a private army by a number of commentators and politicians. The IRA described its actions throughout the Troubles as a military campaign waged against the British Army, the AUC, other security forces, judiciary, loyalist politicians and loyalist paramilitaries in Northern Ireland, England and Europe. The IRA considers these groups to be all part of the same apparatus. As noted above, the IRA seeks to draw a direct ascendancy from the original IRA and those who engaged in the Irish War of Independence. The IRA sees the previous conflict as a guerrilla war which accomplished some of its aims, with some remaining unfinished business. A process called criminalization was begun in the mid-1970s as part of a British strategy of criminalization, Ulsterization, and normalization. The policy was outlined in a 1975 British strategy paper titled The Way Ahead, which was not published but was referred to by Labour's first Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Merlin Rees, and came to be the dominant British political theme in the conflict as it raged into the 1980s. Another categorization avoids the terms guerrilla, or terrorist, but does view the conflict in military terms. The phrase originated with the British military strategist Frank Kitson who was active in Northern Ireland during the early 1970s. In Kitson's view, the violence of the IRA represented an insurrection situation, with the enveloping atmosphere of belligerence representing a low-intensity conflict a Euro a conflict where the forces involved in fighting operate at a greatly reduced tempo, with fewer combatants, at a reduced range of tactical equipment and limited scope to operate in a military manner. Membership of the IRA remains illegal in both the UK and the Republic of Ireland, but IRA prisoners convicted of offences committed before 1998 have been granted conditional early release as part of the Good Friday Agreement. In the United Kingdom a person convicted of membership of a prescribed organisation, such as the IRA, still nominally faces imprisonment for up to 10 years. Strength and Support Numerical Strength In the early to mid-1970s, the numbers recruited by the IRA may have reached several thousand, but these were reduced when the IRA reorganized its structures from 1977 onwards. An AUC report of 1986 estimated that the IRA had 300 or so members in active service units and up to 750 active members in total in Northern Ireland. This does not take into consideration the IRA units in the Republic of Ireland or those in Britain, continental Europe, and throughout the world. In 2005, the then Irish Minister for Justice, Equality and Law Reform, Michael McDowell told the Dáil that the organisation had between 1,000 and 1,500 active members. According to the book The Provisional IRA, roughly 8,000 people passed through the ranks of the IRA in the first 20 years of its existence, many of them leaving after arrest, retirement, or disillusionment. In later years, the IRA's strength has been somewhat weakened by members leaving the organization to join hardline splinter groups such as the Continuity IRA and the Real IRA. According to former Irish Minister for Justice Michael McDowell, these organizations have little more than 150 members each. Electoral and popular support The popular support for the IRA's campaign in the Troubles is hard to gauge, given that Sinn Féin copyright in, the IRA's political wing did not stand in elections until the early 1980s. Most nationalists in Northern Ireland voted for the moderate Social Democratic and Labour Party until 2001. After the 1981 hunger strike, Sinn Féin copyright and mobilised large electoral support and won 105,000 votes, or 43% of the nationalist vote in Northern Ireland, in the United Kingdom general election, 1983. 
only 34,000 votes behind the SDLP. However, by the 1992 UK general election, the SDLP won 184,445 votes and four seats to Sinn Féin copyright in 78,291 votes and no seats. In the 1993 local district council elections in Northern Ireland, the SDLP won 136,760 votes to Sinn Féin copyright in 77,600 votes. Few Protestant voters voted for Sinn Féin copyright in. In 1992, many of them voted for SDLP West Belfast candidate Joe Hendren rather than a unionist candidate to make sure Jerry Adams of Sinn Féin copyright in lost his seat in the constituency. The IRA enjoyed some popular support in the Republic of Ireland in the early 70s. However, the movement's appeal was hurt badly by bombings such as the killing of civilians attending a Remembrance Day ceremony at the Cenotaph in Eniskillen in 1987, and the death of two children when a bomb exploded in Warrington, which led to tens of thousands of people demonstrating on O'Connell Street in Dublin to call for an end to the IRA's campaign. In the 1987 Irish general election, they won only 1.7% of the votes cast. They did not make significant electoral gains in the Republic until after the IRA ceasefires and the Good Friday Agreement of 1998. By the 2011 Irish general election Sinn Féin copyright in's proportion of the popular vote had reached 9.9%. Sinn Féin copyright in now has 27 members of the Northern Ireland Assembly, 5 Westminster MPs and 14 Republic of Ireland TDs. Support from other countries and organisations the IRA have had contacts with foreign governments and other illegal armed organizations. Libya has been the biggest single supplier of arms and funds to the IRA, donating large amounts, three shipments of arms in the early 1970s and another three in the mid-1980s, the latter reputedly enough to arm two regular infantry battalions. The IRA has also received weapons and logistical support from Irish Americans in the United States. Apart from the Libyan aid, this has been the main source of overseas IRA support. American support has been weakened by the war against terrorism, and the fallout from the events of September 11, 2001. In the United States in November 1982, five men were acquitted of smuggling arms to the IRA after they claimed the Central Intelligence Agency had approved the shipment, although the CIA denied this. There are allegations of contact with the East German Stasi, based on the testimony of a Soviet defector to British intelligence Vasily Mitrokhin. Mitrokhin revealed that although the Soviet KGB gave some weapons to the Marxist official IRA, it had little sympathy with the provisionals. The IRA has received some training and support from the Palestine Liberation Organization. In 1977, the provisionals received a sizable arms shipment from the PLO, including small arms, rocket launchers and explosives but this was intercepted at Antwerp after the Israeli intelligence alerted its European counterparts. According to Dr. Mir Ali Montazam, one-time first secretary at the Iranian embassy, Iran played a key part in funding the IRA during the 1980s. Iranian officials deposited a £4 million into a secret Jersey bank account, funded by the sale of artwork from the Iranian embassy in London. Hadi Ghaffari, the machine gun Muller, was sent to Belfast and organized the distribution of the money via sympathetic Irish businessmen. It has been alleged that the IRA had a cooperative relationship with Basque militant group ETAs since the early 1970s. In 1973 it was accused of providing explosives for the assassination of Luis Carrero Blanco in Madrid. In the 1970s, ETA also exchanged a quantity of handguns for training in explosives with the IRA. In addition, the leaders of the political wings of the respective Irish Republican and Basque separatist movements have exchanged visits on several occasions to express solidarity with each other's cause. Prominent former IRA prisoners such as Brendan McFarlane and Brendan Hughes have campaigned for the release of ETA prisoners. In the mid-1990s after the IRA ceasefire, Basque media outlets followed the process carefully sending a team to follow the families of those killed on Bloody Sunday as they campaigned for apology. In May 1996, the Federal Security Service, Russia's internal security service, 
publicly accused Estonia of arms smuggling, and claimed that the IRA had contacted representatives of Estonia's volunteer defense force, Karitsliite, and some non-government groups to buy weapons. In 2001, three Irish men, who later became known as the Columbia Three, were arrested after allegedly training Colombian guerrillas, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, in bomb-making and urban warfare techniques. The U.S. House of Representatives Committee on International Relations in its report of April 24, 2002 concluded, neither committee investigators nor the Colombians can find credible explanations for the increased, more sophisticated capacity for these specific terror tactics now being employed by the FARC, other than IRA training. Good Friday Agreement the IRA ceasefire in 1997 formed part of a process that led to the 1998 Belfast Agreement. One aim of the agreement is that all paramilitary groups in Northern Ireland cease their activities and disarm by May 2000. Calls from Sinn Féin copyright and led the IRA to commence disarming in a process that was monitored by Canadian General John de Chase Lane's decommissioning body in October 2001. However, Following the collapse of the Stormont power sharing government in 2002, which was partly triggered by allegations that Republican spies were operating within Parliament buildings and the civil service, the IRA temporarily broke off contact with General de Chase Lane. In December 2004, attempts to persuade the IRA to disarm entirely collapsed when the Democratic Unionist Party, under Ian Paisley, insisted on photographic evidence. Justice Minister Michael McDowell insisted that there would need to be a complete end to IRA activity. At the beginning of February 2005, the IRA declared that it was withdrawing from the disarmament process, but in July 2005 it declared that its campaign of violence was over, and that transparent mechanisms would be used, under the de Chase Lane process, to satisfy the Northern Ireland communities that it was disarming totally. End of the armed campaign on July 28, 2005, the IRA Army Council announced an end to its armed campaign, stating that it would work to achieve its aims using purely political and democratic programs through exclusively peaceful means, and shortly afterwards completed decommissioning. In September 2008, the 19th Report of the Independent Monitoring Commission stated that the IRA was committed to the political path and no longer represented a threat to peace or to democratic politics, and that the IRA's Army Council was no longer operational or functional. The organisation remains classified as a proscribed terrorist group in the UK and as an illegal organisation in the Republic of Ireland. Two small groups split from the IRA, the Continuity IRA in 1986, and the Real IRA in 1997. Both reject the Good Friday Agreement and continue to engage in paramilitary activity. In a statement read by Tsar copyright Anna Brethnach, the organization stated that it had instructed its members to dump all weapons and not to engage in any other activities whatsoever apart from assisting the development of purely political and democratic programs through exclusively peaceful means. Furthermore, the organization authorized its representatives to engage immediately with the Independent International Commission on Decommissioning to verifiably put its arms beyond use in a way which will further enhance public confidence and to conclude this as quickly as possible. This is not the first time that organizations styling themselves IRA have issued orders to dump arms. After its defeat in the Irish Civil War in 1924 and at the end of its unsuccessful border campaign in 1962, the IRA Army Council issued similar orders. However, this is the first time in Irish republicanism that any organization has voluntarily decided to dispose of its arms. Some authors, like Patrick McCarthy, Peter Taylor and Brendan O'Brien concluded that, unlike previous IRA campaigns, the provisionals were not defeated. On September 25, 2005, international weapons inspectors supervised the full disarmament of the IRA a long-sought goal of Northern Ireland's peace process. The office of IICD Chairman John de Chase Lane, a retired Canadian general who oversaw the weapons decommissioning at secret locations, released details regarding the scrapping of many tons of IRA weaponry at a news conference in Belfast on September 26. He said the arms had been put beyond use, and that they were satisfied that the arms decommissioned represent the totality of the IRA's arsenal. 
the IRA permitted two independent witnesses, including a Methodist minister, Reverend Harold Good, and Father Alec Reed, a Roman Catholic priest close to Sinn Féin copyright and leader Jerry Adams, to view the secret disarmament work. Ian Paisley, the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, complained that since the witnesses were appointed by the IRA themselves, rather than being appointed by the British or Irish governments, they therefore could not be said to be unbiased witnesses to the decommissioning. Nationalists and Catholics viewed his comments as reflecting his refusal to support devolution in Northern Ireland with Catholics in power. In 2011 Sinn Féin copyright and President Gerry Adams said, The war is over. The IRA is gone. The IRA embraced, facilitated and supported the peace process. When a democratic and peaceful alternative to armed struggle was created the IRA left the stage. In 2014 Adams said, the IRA is gone. It is finished. Continuing activities of IRA members, the 10th report published in April 2006 from the Independent Monitoring Commission, an organization monitoring activity by paramilitary groups on behalf of the British and Irish governments, prefaced its remarks about IRA activity by commenting that the IRA leadership has committed itself to following a peaceful path and that in the last three months this process has involved the further dismantling of the IRA as a military structure. The report commented that there was no paramilitary or violent activity sanctioned by the leadership. There is a substantial erosion in the IRA's capacity to return to a military campaign. And, that the IRA had no intentions of returning to violence. However the IMC report also noted that following decommissioning, the IRA still retained a considerable amount of weaponry beyond what was needed for self-defense. The IMC has come in for criticism as having been set up outside the terms of the Good Friday Agreement as a SOP to unionism. Sinn Féin copyright and MP Connor Murphy stated that the IMC was established outside and in breach of the terms of the Good Friday Agreement and that it is politically biased, and had an anti Sinn Féin copyright in agenda. On October 4, 2006, the IMC ruled that the IRA were no longer a threat. In late 2008, the The Sunday Times quoted a senior Garda intelligence officer as saying that the IRA had recruited in recent years, still held arms despite apparently decommissioning the lot, and was being maintained in shadow form. The Garda also said that the IRA was still capable of carrying out attacks. A senior member of the PSNI, Assistant Chief Constable Peter Sheridan, said that it was unlikely that the IRA would disband in the foreseeable future. At the end of March 2010, SDLP MLA Dominic Bradley said that the IRA were still active and that they had been responsible for a number of incidents in his constituency including a punishment shooting and an armed robbery during which a shot was fired. In August 2010, the 32 County Sovereignty Movement, the Republican Network for Unity and the UPRG, claimed that the IRA were responsible for a shooting incident in the Gobna Scale area of Derry. It is claimed that up to 20 masked men, some armed with handguns, attacked a group of teenagers who were engaging in antisocial behavior at an interface area. A number of the teenagers were attacked and shots were fired into the air. The men are then reported to have removed their masks when the PSNI arrived and were subsequently identified as members of the Republican movement. Shin Far copyright and denied the IRA were involved. P. O'Neill the IRA traditionally uses a well-known signature in its public statements, which are all issued under the pseudonym of P. O'Neill of the Irish Republican Publicity Bureau, Dublin. According to Runera Bradaya, it was C. N. Max Jifferin, as Chief of Staff of the IRA, who invented the name. However, under his usage, the name was written and pronounced according to Irish orthography and pronunciation as P. N. R. Copyright Ill. According to Danny Morrison, the pseudonym S. O'Neill was used during the 1940s. Informers, throughout the Troubles, some members of the IRA passed information to the security forces. Members of the IRA suspected of being informants were usually executed after an IRA court martial. In the 1980s, many more IRA members were imprisoned on the testimony of former IRA members known as supergrasses such as Raymond Gilmore. A Belfast newspaper has claimed that secret documents show that half of the IRA's top men were also British informers. 
In recent years, there have been some high-profile allegations of senior IRA figures having been British informers. In May 2003, a number of newspapers named Freddie Scapatici as the alleged identity of the British Force Research Unit's most senior informer within the IRA, codenamed Starkey Knife, who is thought to have been head of the IRA's internal security force, charged with rooting out and executing informers. Scapatici denies that this is the case and, in 2003, failed in a legal bid to force the then NIO minister, Jane Kennedy, to state he was not an informer. She has refused to do so, and since then Scapatici has not launched any libel actions against the media making the allegations. On December 16, 2005, senior Sinn Féin copyright and member Dennis Donaldson appeared before TV cameras in Dublin and confessed to being a British spy for 20 years. He was expelled from Sinn Féin copyright and was said to have been debriefed by the party. Donaldson was a former IRA volunteer and subsequently highly placed Sinn Féin copyright in party member. Donaldson had been entrusted by Jerry Adams with the running of Sinn Féin copyright in operations in the U.S. in the early 1990s. On April 4, 2006, Donaldson was found shot dead at his retreat near Glentis in County Donegal. When asked whether he felt Donaldson's role as an informer in Sinn Féin copyright in was significant, the IRA double agent using the pseudonym Kevin Fulton described Donaldson's role as a spy within Sinn Féin copyright and as the tip of the iceberg. The real IRA claimed responsibility for his assassination on April 12, 2009. On February 8, 2008, Roy McShane was taken into police protection after being unmasked as an informant. McShane, a former IRA member, had been Jerry Adams' personal driver for many years. Adams said he was too philosophical to feel betrayed. See also, British Military Intelligence Systems in Northern Ireland, History of Northern Ireland, List of Chronologies of Provisional Irish Republican Army Actions, List of Provisional IRA Dead, Eddie Copeland, Julia Parry, Jerry Adams, References. Sources, Martin Dillon, 25 Years of Terror A Euro The IRA's War Against the British, Richard English. Armstrong Lee a Euro A History of the IRA, Macmillan, London 2003, ISBN 1-4050-0108-9, Peter Taylor, Provost A Euro of the IRA and Sinn Féin Copyright in, Ed Maloney, A Secret History of the IRA, Penguin, London 2002, A. Amon Malley and Patrick Bishop, The Provisional IRA, Corgi, London 1988. ISBN 0-552-13337-X, Toby Hunden, Bandit County A Euro The IRA in South Amar, Hodder and Stoughton, London 1999, ISBN 0-340-71736-X, Brendan O'Brien, The Long War in A Euro The IRA and Sinn Féin Copyright in. O'Brien Press, Dublin 1995, ISBN 0-86278-359-3, Tim Pat Coogan, The Troubles, Tim Pat Coogan, The IRA, A History, Tony Geraghty, The Irish War, 1998 ISBN 0-8018-6456-9, David McKittrick, Seamus Kelters, Brian Feeney, Chris Thornton, David McVie, Lost Lives. J. Bo Wire Bell, the Secret Army Euro the IRA, 1997 Third Edition, ISBN 1-85371-813-0, Christopher Andrews, The Mitrokin Archive, Ronald John Wietza, Policing Under Fire, Ethnic Conflict and Police Community Relations in Northern Ireland, State University of New York Press, ISBN 0791422247X. Further reading, Bell. J. Bo Wire. Dragon World, Deception, Tradecraft, and the Provisional IRA. International Journal of Intelligence and Counterintelligence. Volume 8, Number 1, Spring 1995. Pages 21 to 50. Published online January 9, 2008. Available at ResearchGate, external links, Kane Archive of IRA Statements. FAS Intelligence Resource Program A Euro Irish Republican Army, Provisional Irish Republican Army, Behind the Mask, 
the IRA and Sinn Féin PBS frontline documentary on the subject. IRA and U.S. funding from the Dean Peter Croft Foreign Affairs Digital Archives.